Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Make Your Land Available for Farming, a recorded webinar for farmland owners in New England and elsewhere. Um, this project is part of the Land for Farmers project, so supported by the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program Grant um, out of the USDA. And this webinar is being hosted by the New England FarmLink Collaborative, which is a collaborative effort um, that includes Connecticut FarmLink, Maine FarmLink, Vermont FarmLink, um, and Land for Good, who administers New England Farmland Finder. My name is Rachel Bryce, and I'm the program coordinator with Land for Good. I'm here as your host and facilitator today, and we're also joined by representatives of the other FarmLink programs. I'm speaking with you from um, Abenaki territory, which is currently known as New Hampshire. Um, land is something that is sacred to all of us, something to be um, honored and treasured rather than exploited. And at Land for Good and Nefelsi, we have an awareness of the real lived history of indigenous peoples and nations in a long and ongoing era of colonialism. Um, so we're taking a moment to honor and acknowledge those who stewarded the land before us and continue to do so. Um, if this map is something that's interesting to you uh, that you haven't seen before, um, you can also explore this map for the place where you live. And I'm putting the link to that in the chat right now. Um, in an effort to continue to bring forth indigenous narratives, um, this map from Native Land Digital is an online map that wipes away the borders imposed by colonial powers to reveal complex and colorful overlap of indigenous territories, languages, and treaties. Um, and of course, these um, it's not complete, it's ongoing, it's a living map. People continue to add um, information to it all the time, but if it's something you're interested in, I encourage you to check it out. So our plan for, the, for today is uh, in just a few moments, I'll hand it over to um, our speakers, um, and after they share information with you about different specific methods for sharing your farmland with a farmer, we have um, a visiting guest speaker today, Stacy Brenner, who is the Senior Advisor for Land Access with Maine Farmland Trust, will be joining us to tell us more about her experience from um, both sides of the story, both as a landowner and also a person who works in farmland access. And you'll have um, plenty of time to ask questions and get some answers to your questions as well before we close. So that's our plan for today. And with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm Nikki Leonard. I'm coming to you from Vermont Land Link. Uh, I also work with um, farmers with their land access and business planning uh, needs uh, out of the Intervale Center uh, out of Vermont, uh, Burlington. Um, so yeah, so when we put these methods uh, together, um, we know that many of you probably have differing experiences in farming and or working with farmers. Um, so we're going to try and give you kind of this very brief overview today with just kind of keeping all of that in mind. Um, so we're going to start off with the land purchase. Um, you know, this is probably the traditional buy-sell model that we're all probably most familiar with. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the details or logistics of selling one's land. Um, but we do want to kind of comment on wanting to sell your land to a farmer um, and go over some of those unique considerations and some of the challenges too, maybe uh, to be aware of. Um, so again, kind of there's these differing goals that may be competing or conflicting with the realities of, of, of what's happening. Um, you know, there's the reality of soaring land costs, especially in New England, kind of up against the hardship or barriers and challenges that farmers face, especially those farmers with limited capital um, when trying to qualify for your more traditional, you know, mortgage options uh, to buy farmland. Um, you know, you may also have a, a goal of wanting to support the next generation of farmers. Again, this is kind of all in the financial realm of wanting to also recoup your, your land investment for your own financial needs. Um, kind of also kind of floating in this picture, you might have heard about conservation or agricultural easements as an option of a way to kind of balance these goals and conflicting realities. Um, but maybe you're just not quite sure of, you know, how much you can sell your property if you were to go through this process versus maybe sell it on the open market. Um, so I guess kind of let's first dive into maybe 
I'm talking about conservation easements and working with land trusts. Um, right away, I really want to dispel maybe this myth of that if you are considering to conserve your land, maybe you won't receive this fair market value for it and you'd have to sell it at a much lower price than you'd want to. And that simply is not true. Um, you know, your land will still get appraised uh, for its market value and also kind of this lesser agricultural value. Um, but really like the difference between those two values is the cost of the easement that the land trust will pay you. Um, the farmer then will pay you kind of the remaining ag value. And again, kind of those two amounts together total your property's fair market value at that time of appraisal. Um, this is also to say too, that we're assuming your property fits within the criteria of what the land trusts are you know, interested in conserving. Um, last week, we talked a lot about soils and acreage, um, water resources, infrastructure, all these um, aspects of your property that farmers are interested in. And kind of the same thing applies to what conservation efforts are interested in as well. Um, kind of one last thing to touch on this process, it is a forever decision, uh, just for you to keep that in mind. Uh, these easements will stay on a property deed in perpetuity. Um, and just a little kind of hint of this process, a map will be drawn you know, of the property, kind of designating what acreage is to be conserved, uh, meaning that no development can happen, um, and then what parts of the property um, that would be excluded from the easement, meaning kind of what can be developed with restrictions uh, in the future. Um, this is a very complicated process, and because it's forever, you know, forever, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot of planning. So working with advisors from the land trust um, and the incoming farmer too, um, it's definitely key. It's just a lot of pieces to this puzzle. Um, but I will say that the payoff is a win-win-win, right? Like the win for you uh, for getting the market value of the sale of your property, a win for the land trust and achieving their goals of conservation and conserving farmland, um, and then a win for the farmer uh, to be able to purchase your land kind of more affordably. Um, and I guess when we're kind of talking about purchase and financing, um, the whole financial process that the farmer goes through um, there's definitely that consideration for you to be aware of. Um, you know, there are a variety of government resources available to help farmers purchase farmland through a traditional sale. Um, maybe the most well-known, the USDA Farm Service Agency or the FSA, uh, they provide access to loans um, to farmers that meet certain requirements. Um, and I will say this, just kind of keep it in mind that if your farmer is to finance this purchase this way, um, it just takes a very, very, very long time in the eyes of real estate. Um, so maybe instead of that 30 or 45 day close, um, you know, if you're able to putting in a much later date uh, to close and that farm purchase and sales agreement will definitely make everyone's lives easier. Um, and working with farmers one-on-one -on -one through this process and working with them navigating, you know, FSA loans, Currently, for example, if a farmer were to submit their full application today, we're hearing feedback that it's taking seven, eight months um, just to even get their application processed. Um, so again, just there's a lot, I guess, to consider and be aware of, even the things that are just outside of the farmer's control. Um, so flexibility and patience, like most things, um, would be key. Uh, next slide. Um, farm succession or transfer, um, I'm going to be really, really brief on this one, not because it's the easiest method, um, but because it's the most complicated, and this just isn't the proper, I think, space to, to go through it all. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background, um, when talking about succession or transfer, we're usually not just talking about selling the land, but we're also kind of talking through transferring potentially an active farm business, the equipment, markets, knowledge, other assets. Um, we're also probably going to be talking about your next life chapter, um, thinking through estate planning, retirement needs. Um, again, there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, this process takes a few years um, at minimum. Um, and just because of its complicated um, you know, nature, uh, this transfer planning is definitely not a do-it-yourself process. Uh, you'll definitely need kind of a, a team of advisors to 
you know, help navigate the best practices. And there's a lot of paperwork uh, in legal documents that go into this process as well, uh, beyond that purchase and sale. Um, and this team, but mostly, you know, we recommend kind of including a farm business planner to guide and facilitate all of this. Probably your financial advisor who's aware of your financial goals and needs. Um, a lawyer or two, um, that's going to be definitely something that we talked about last week, right? That keeps popping up. You're going to hear it again later today, like a lawyer to help draft these legal documents is definitely needed. Um, your accountant and possibly med you know, mediation or other professionals to help with conflict resolution um, if that's necessary. And just kind of to end on that, there's a lot of great resources out there to help you get started in this process, including Land for Good. Um, so be sure to check out, you know, their websites for upcoming workshops and webinars like this. Great. Thanks, Nikki. Um, my name is Jay Silverman. I'm the Massachusetts field agent with Land for Good, and I'm also a first generation hay farmer in Conway, Massachusetts. Um, so I sort of wanted to focus a little bit on leasing and what that might look like uh, to lease land to a farmer. And I wanted to kick that off with a little bit of interaction from everybody um, via the, the chat that we have um, in Zoom. So doing a, a quick little impromptu chat poll here about those of you present, trying to unpack from a farmer's perspective, leasing land. Um, what what advantages come to mind for folks? Uh, why a farming tenant would be interested in leased land and, and advantages to seeking out that arrangement? Um, so if you have any thoughts or ideas, uh, throw that right in the chat and I'll sort of um, re report them out as they come in. But coming into this, i um, curious to hear people's thoughts on that and why someone might approach you to, to lease land. Okay, great. So you have a low commitment to start from that farmer potentially, whether that's monetary or, um, you know, depending how much how much land they're accessing, absolutely. Um, Sure. Okay. So keeping the land in agriculture, and that can certainly be a win-win for both both parties. Um, and uh, yeah, whether that's producing income or food, and depending on the landowner's involvement in that, absolutely. Sure. So someone looking to get started on land as a first-time farmer, that can be a big advantage to leasing rather than going into other um, longer-term types of of ownership or things like that. Um, Great. The idea of paying the taxes for the landowner, potentially, um, as far as that factoring into the lease rates or current use taxes or things like that. Um, awesome. No, this, this is great. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, the idea of less less debt, potentially um, working on growing your business with some of those beginning funds. That's a big thing we see from, from beginning farmers or folks looking to lease land. Um, yeah, and the capital investment piece. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Keep them coming. I'll read them as they, they come, but you guys are really, really hitting this. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So so absolutely, you, you guys are really getting this. Um, sometimes it's really the only way their business model can work either to begin with or long term. Um, I'll share that with my haying business, my long term strategy is to lease land uh, because the way that that the hay economy works, at least in my area, there, there's really not a way that I could justify the ownership costs of land. Um, and I really focus on the, the mutualistic benefit with the landowner. And then sometimes it, there's actually not the available land that people need or want in their search area, um, either yet or at all. It really depends. So sometimes people find, end up leasing land simply because they don't have anything that they that meets their criteria um, to purchase. So that's great. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So how about disadvantages? What what come to mind for folks as far as uh, disadvantages from the farmer's perspective of of leasing the land? Um, why might they either hesitate or not have that as part of their long-term land strategy? Sure. So less control. This idea of of the farmer having a checkpoint and somebody else to um you know to communicate with about what they can and can't do on the land can be a big point of pause for folks. Yeah, this is great. So and less long-term security. Definitely. So this, <laughs> um, depending what the lease says and the terms of the lease and the length of the lease, it can be hard to, um, you know, to make investments or to necessarily, yeah, know if the land is going to get sold to somebody else and whether they can be in that pipeline to potentially buy it later. Um, yeah, great. So this idea of, of land investment, how long the lease is, we'll talk a little bit about a, a well-crafted lease and ways for the farmer to kind of be protected on the landowner changing their mind. But that's something for, for uh, landowners to be thinking about and what kind of 
planning horizon can they offer a farmer and what are you willing to commit to um versus uh you know being able to, to change your mind or back out of the agreement later um okay great so this is also talking about just disadvantages from the landowner's perspective and what state the farmer keeps the land in absolutely and that's something the farmer needs to think about too and communicate about um what the aesthetics might look like and what their day-to-day -day operation might look like um and of course that yeah the equity and financing piece this, this is great thank you all for, for participating so much certainly keep them coming in there as, as things come to mind I want to be cognizant of time too um oh okay, ne next slide please um so yeah you, you guys really really hit this hit this on the nose um you know the relationships to manage and sometimes from the farmer's perspective they either need to work heavily with the landowner to get uh grants or other programs or they actually don't acquire don't um aren't eligible for them depending on how the lease and stuff is constructed so this is great I think you know really putting yourselves in the shoes of why a farmer might be interested and why they might be approaching you can be the real first step to kind of engaging in dialogue and negotiation on that so thanks for participating um all right next slide please so a lease in itself um can really range from being quite simple to quite complex and really depends on what the uh the arrangement's trying to satisfy depends on the length of the lease and other factors and I think the biggest checkpoint, first of all, is whether the lease is actually in writing or not. Um, there's lots of handshake agreements that happen in farming. And um, there's sort of that, that old saying that a, a verbal agreement is as good as the paper it's written on, which basically means that if something goes sideways in the arrangement, there's really nothing to fall back on about what was said, what was agreed upon, um, you know, what's legally enforceable if it goes that gets down to that route. And so, um, you know, I think all of our organizations work with folks to really try to get these arrangements in writing whenever possible, especially if there's a lot of risk at play. Um, sometimes a hayfield lease can be a handshake because there's not a lot at stake if something were to change. Still, still certainly disruptive to the farmer, but um, not nearly as much as, as lots of planted crops or infrastructure or something where they're doing multi-year investments. Um, so really trying to encourage folks to get leases in writing and to try to debunk that process a little bit. So at its basis, a lease can really just be these five things. You have to stipulate who the parties are, um, where the lease premises is, how long the lease is actually lasting for, um, how much is being exchanged, either monetarily or other goods or services, and signatures of folks. So these really just as a baseline uh, constitute a very simple lease. Um, next slide, please. And this is not meant for you to read. And in fact, <laughs> the... the um, resolution didn't come through well but there's a lot of other things that can go into a lease and I just wanted to point out a resource that we have on the land for good website which is the elements of a good farm lease guide that I really rely on and, and work with people a lot um to work, start as a brainstorming tool about what are the different aspects of a lease arrangement that you're trying to figure out and so um this can be really helpful for farmers to look at um what their needs are as well as you as landowners um looking through the different aspects of what uh what's permitted or not on the land um you know different stewardship considerations or other pieces that might make this lease slightly more complicated but in a way to really meet everybody's concerns and and try to get everything laid out on paper um so if I I'm always willing to take any questions about this stuff um both on or offline but definitely wanted to point out this resource if you want to dig a little bit deeper um next slide please one thing that comes up a lot for folks is this idea of lease to own um we got a, a lot of questions about that from farmers as well as landowners that are maybe looking at uh, either a more flexible timeline for a buyer, or they're not quite sure yet, but they might want to get a tenant in the pipeline. So, um, so lease to own is a phrase that's used a lot, and it sort of has this, um, you know, it's it's a little bit of an unofficial term, and so it really comes into these three buckets. The first and simplest um, area of lease to own is the idea of a right of first refusal um, or right of first offer, depending how that that works, but where someone um often the tenant can have this right of first refusal on the property that should the property ever be sold uh they get the first option to purchase it um it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be ready and it doesn't mean that they'll necessarily like the price that's being being asked um or offered by another party and uh it doesn't guarantee it's ever going to happen but it can be this kind of stop stop gap measure to try to help protect the uh the tenant's interests and allow them to access the property or potentially purchase it in the future um step up from that is a purchase option where the landowner is um agreeing to sell the property at a future time um at a certain price or perhaps with a formula to adjust that price over time and it's a way for a tenant to try out a property save up some capital apply for financing um and purchase the property at a future point point. and then the third option that's a bit of a that 
builds on that is the idea of some amount of the rent going toward the purchase price. And in working with a lot of farm seekers, when they talk about lease to own, I think this is what a lot of them have in mind, having a lease where some or even all of the, the rental amount is going towards the future purchase price. And that does happen sometimes, um, but it's it's definitely a calculus for a landowner about what they feel ready to offer. And looking at your own carrying costs of the land as a landowner and whether any of that rent could go towards a future down payment or not. Um, so that's really all part of the overall negotiation. But uh, just wanted to kind of make note of the different ways that this this works. Is a very brief overview, <laughs> and um, we you know we we have a, a guide on the website about lease to own uh, the Land for Good website, and um, always happy to help people think this through and try to figure out what might fit and help um, yeah help your land's legacy as well as the the folks that might be farming your land. Um, next slide, please. So negotiating a lease, um, Nikki started talking about this last week, and so spending time really talking with a tenant about how a lease might work, looking at that basic outline of those, those five principles of a lease, but then all of the other bits that might make your situation either unique or have to have its own considerations. And so when we engage in this process with folks, it can be really tempting for someone to go and try to draft up a rough draft lease uh, full of legal language that needs to be edited. And um, while that's the eventual step we go toward, it's really helpful to back up a bit and talk with the other party about specifics and really focus on what are the needs, what are the concerns, um, what things would would make someone walk away from a situation, and trying to get as specific as possible. Sometimes there can be a lot of vague answers that are given or things that it's really tempting to say, oh, we'll figure it out when we get there. Um, but it's important to spend some time unpacking that and recognize what what ramifications could happen or what the worst case scenario is if um, the parties can't agree on that, that um, item at the future point. So we focus on kind of this tool, or at least I've, I've used with a lot of folks, of doing a rough draft plain language lease outline, um, which is a, a tool we're working on developing. And it follows that same um, outline of the elements of a good farm lease, just to help the parties write down in plain language what it is you want for each section of a lease and use that as the point to negotiate off of, trade that back and forth, um, sometimes have facilitated meetings with um, different, <laughs> different service providers um, to help iron out what the lease agreement is before taking the step of putting it in formal language. Um, and we always want to make sure both parties have an, a lawyer review the final lease language. Um, sometimes attorneys can help actually turn the outline into that, depending on what people need. Um, and that's, that's something we do at Land for Good as well, to just help people get to that final step. Um, it can be really tempting not to have an attorney lay eyes on it. It can be this great um, synergistic conversation. You can have this great legally worded lease draft. Um, but the analogy I always make is that a lease is like a seatbelt and you want to make sure that it's functioning properly. Um, and you want to have an expert kind of give you that peace of mind that it's it's working and ready to do what it needs to do when you need it. And then hopefully you can relax into the relationship um, with the tenant and kind of take things as they come, but know you have this solid foundation to rely upon. Um, next slide, please. So this question actually came up via the evaluation um, from the last session. So thanks again for everybody that filled it out. And there will be another link for this this week. It is really important for us to get um, get feedback and what's resonating with folks and what questions you have. So thanks to those that, that participated in that last week. Um, something we talk about a lot. And so just wanted to work in a really quick example of what we tend to see for rental rates in New England. Um, with the caveat that this varies a lot, uh, the pandemic and inflation is absolutely affecting this. There's lots of differences around the region. Um, and certainly you move out of the region and it changes um, drastically. So for those of you, depending where you're calling in from. Um, but for raw land, one thing you can do is look at what other comparable land rents are. And what we tend to see in New England, again, with always always exceptions to the rule in both directions, um, is that your basic tillable acreage could maybe be 50 to 100 bucks an acre per year in rent. Um, again, with, this is for raw land with no infrastructure. Um, pasture and hayland is often much less or even free. That's actually the case with all of the hayland that I use is, is free lease. And so we focus on the benefits the landowner gets um, in lieu of, of rent. Um, and then prime soils can go the other direction where that can actually go up quite a bit. And sometimes in the Connecticut River Valley, um, you know, pretty close to me in Massachusetts, we can see those those rental rates go up to three or $400 an acre per year. I've seen some even go higher than that, but it really, really depends what the farmer's business plan is, how intensive their their cropping is, and you know truly what they can afford. Um, infrastructure is wildly variable, and there's a lot of ways to tackle that that um, 
unfortunately I don't quite have <laughs> the time to get into in this particular um, webinar, but that, if that's something that, that's of interest, we have um, resources and uh, some other pre-recorded, more in-depth leasing webinars. Um, but basic thing about infrastructure is it's really helping to figure out your carrying costs as the owner, um, what you might be giving up in order to make that available to someone. If it's a piece of infrastructure you're using for something versus something that maybe is not currently in use and someone can make easy advantage of. Um, and figuring out who's paying for what as far as uh, repairs, maintenance, that sort of thing. Um, next slide, please. So in essence, determining the rent, even though you can use comparables, really look at what you need as a landowner and what the farmer can afford. Um, it, it comes down to this overlap and some negotiation and communication um, to really figure out that sweet spot. And it's important in this process for neither party to step too far outside of their comfort zone here. Um, a, a new farmer or a, a farmer interested in your land might be might be tempted to pay more than they feel like they can afford or more than their business planning can afford because it feels like the perfect spot. Um, but in the long term, they might find that that really hamstrings their business and, and that it's not successful there. And likewise, you as the landowner, you might have some really solid financial needs of, of what you need in order to make the arrangement work. Um, and it's possible that given your circumstances that allowing it to be rented for less um, might not allow you to keep the property long term. So in general, trying to find the sweet spot through negotiation and discussion and, and being as open and honest as the parties feel comfortable with um, can hopefully allow for a long-term arrangement that, that works sustainably. Um, next slide, please. So we talked a bit about land goals as a landowner um, in, in last week's webinar, as well as, as what Nikki covered in terms of sales of property. And so what I really wanted to focus on were these bold items about land management and trying to figure out as you're, especially as you're looking at leasing out your land, if that's what you're interested in, and trying to figure out what main goals you're trying to satisfy are by offering that lease. And um, what I'm getting at here is thinking about how much involvement you're hoping to have in whatever you're envisioning. Um, is it something where you just want to make the land available? You might have some ideas about um, whether you're interested in livestock or vegetables or what sort of options you're open to seeing, um, but truly up for having a tenant running their own business there with minimal involvement from you as the landowner. Or, or do you have some visions that um, have a lot of guidelines from you and a lot of places where you'd like to be involved and like to have input on exactly what's happening and where and when and per perhaps how it looks? And so one of the options to think about for your situation is whether a hired manager is a better fit for you, depending on um, your, your goals and what you're looking for as a landowner. Um, next slide, please. And I'll talk a little more about that. So when we talk about hiring a manager, it's really um, not necessarily having a, a lease in place, but having an employee that you um, are hiring to manage your property. And maybe that's run a business that you're involved with or other ways to keep your land in farming or even to, to start agricultural production on your land. But rather than using a lease, it's, it's having someone that you're hiring and having direct control over. And it means you can have a lot of involvement and a lot of oversight in what they're doing. Um, the flip side of that is it means you need to have the knowledge base and willingness to accept that responsibility for what's happening. Um, and, you know, some folks are looking to start a, a business on their land that maybe they're not the principal um, person doing the work, but but involved in the capital costs and um, trying to factor in if there's a way to have a return on that business. And so looking at what the actual labor costs would be to have someone hired as a manager, manager for your land. And even though there might be potential revenue, um, what are the other costs you're looking at and what kind of business planning would you want to look at? Um, so this is just an option to be thinking about really depending on your goals. In general, it gets quite challenging for everybody involved and especially the, the tenant farmer, if somebody's leasing from you, um, to have too much involvement and too much oversight and even have some accidental um, partnerships that, that end up um, causing some legal difficulties if the parties aren't planning on forming a partnership. Um, so just something to think about when you're look, thinking about leasing out land and, and whether the amount of control you'd like to have might lend itself to having an employee rather than a tenant. Um, next slide, please. Oh, great. And this is actually handing it off to Will now. Thanks, Jay. Hi, folks. I'm Will Amira. I'm the Connecticut field agent with Land for Good. Sorry about that uh, text box that was appearing there on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm also a vegetable farmer, uh, vegetable and flower farmer in northwestern Connecticut on um, lease land and um, help to administer the Connecticut FarmLink program. Uh, so I wanted to have these slides in here because I think in the last few years um, leading up to COVID, but then also especially in response to COVID, there's been a lot more interest on um, 
farm seekers parts with regards to accessing farmland together, uh, entering into some sort of uh, either cooperative or collaborative farming enterprises or land tenure arrangements. Um, as Nikki mentioned earlier, the uh, increasing costs of farmland tenure uh, have certainly contributed to that. And in fact, for a long time, Land for Good has uh, suggested um, adding more people to your farming operation, either as you know partners or as um, you know multiple entities accessing land as a strategy to make land more affordable. Um, so that that sort of creativity is something that. Um, we see a lot of and uh, with the primary goal of um, identifying viable farmland tenure opportunities. Um, and in addition to just accessing the land, accessing um, land as a group can also create some other uh, benefits to both farm operations and landowners uh, if it's a lease situation, uh, but there are some unique challenges as well that are certainly worth highlighting. Next slide, please. Uh, so some of the benefits <clears throat> is that um, you might be able to have more of your land uh, adequately managed. I know in Connecticut, particularly if you look at some of the, the older conserved uh, farms that are around, uh, some of them were protected all in one, one piece, uh, 400 acres, 500 acres, 600 acres, which um, in most cases now, <clears throat> except for very large dairies that have a lot of um, crop and hayland, uh, that tends to be much more acreage than uh, most farmers are looking for. So if you find yourself in the position that you either own or want to lease a large property, um, kind of looking for one of these cooperative arrangements or collaborative arrangements might be a good fit. Uh, farmers can share resources and offer assistance to one another. Uh, this could look like uh, having equipment sharing schemes or um, going in on um, you know, materials together, uh, saving on shipping, things of that nature. Um, as far as food system development, I think it's a really um, good strategy to allow people to um, kind of grow things in more coordination, um, create some real economies of scale, not necessarily through one operation, but through multiple, uh, and also to create um, sort of uh, demand for um, farm support services, distribution networks, et cetera, um, kind of centralized around hubs with multiple farm operations operating close to one another. Um, from a landowner perspective, you're also potentially granting more land access opportunities with the one property, which is uh, exciting if that's a goal of yours. And then finally, the operations might be complementary to one another. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, how our farm got started in a couple of slides, but a, a really good example of this is um, the added fertility from a you know livestock operation, either through rotating pastures uh, or through you know compost production, could be really beneficial to a vegetable farm, as one example. Some of the drawbacks that um, you're likely to face is that as a landowner, um, and uh, honestly, as um, a farmer as well, there are a lot more relationships to manage. Uh, so a lot more room for conflict, a lot more need for uh, concrete um, mediation or, or conflict resolution um, clauses in whatever agreements you create. Um, and with regards to agreements, they tend to need to be much more complicated as well. Uh, as Jay said, leases can be anything from the this very simple version of the five points on the earlier slide, um, or in a case like this, you might be looking at forming new entities, having you know multiple agreements between uh, the parties in order to um, you know make sure that everyone is is safe and secure in these uh, arrangements. Um, Entry and exit of farming partners is a challenge uh, in these sorts of things. So um, from the landowner perspective, it's a, if it's a sale, this isn't really a concern of yours, but if you're leasing your land um, and you've, you're relying on four farm partners to uh, adequately manage the whole property, um, how are you gonna address uh, changes to the, the structure of those businesses if somebody pulls out and you know suddenly there's um, you know 30 acres that, um, need more, more oversight, more management. Finally, uh, something else to think about is um, 
you know, food safety workflow, how are these uh, different farm enterprises going to interact with each other on a, on a piece of property? Um, one example of this, again, thinking back to the livestock and vegetable farm um, consideration is, you know, things like um, rules dictating how many days uh, manure needs to be on a field before a crop can be um, planted or harvested in it. That's a common concern that people run into. Um, and, and then also just thinking about, you know, as I mentioned a bit last week, how are products and people moving uh, around the different places on the farm? Are there adequate uh, pieces of infrastructure that can be shared? Uh, is there enough flow from the well to support these different um, enterprises or, or people on the farm, et cetera? Next slide, please. So um, in the first slide, I neglected to mention it, uh, but in the past year, Land for Good published uh, in partnership with the National Young Farmer Coalition, our uh, decision tool called Accessing Farmland Together. Uh, it's a resource that's available on our website and we'll certainly put in the chat for you all. Um, but I wanted to just zoom in on this sort of decision tree uh, that sort of breaks down what some of these different groups might look like. Um, and in almost all of these cases, uh, with the exception of the situational group, which I'll talk about, um, these groups can all be um, either renting or, or purchasing land. Uh, so in the one farm group, uh, this is a situation where, you know, um, the farmer is thinking to themselves, I want to start a business, uh, but you know what, I can't really afford land on my own. I'm going to recruit another uh, partner to go in on this. And uh, so from the start, um, they're only thinking about one entity um, and one, basically one farm enterprise. Um, and so they're, you know, executing a lease or a purchase uh, agreement one on one with their business entity and the landowner. So that one's pretty simple, uh, just involves, you know, basically a farm with multiple partners, pretty common scenario. An intentional group is a little bit different from that in that this is where we start to think about um, where, um, you know, one farm producing CSA vegetables and another farm producing hay, livestock, et cetera, might come together to access one piece of land. Um, if they're going to rent, there are a couple of different ways that could look. Um, they might form an entity that leases directly from uh, the landowner and then does some subleases or something like that uh, to the individual farm entities, or they just might have um, separate leases altogether. If they're going to purchase, they're most likely going to have to form one real estate entity that will buy uh, and hold that land for the long term. Um, so this is probably the most um, values or or sort of mission driven approach uh, of the different situations you might run into. Uh, these are people who have hopefully thought this through a lot, gotten some of their um, own uh, legal agreements in place in order to um, you know create this opportunity or multiple opportunities on a piece of land. The situational group um, most likely are leasing because these uh, people have not um, necessarily planned this, but this is a, a sort of opportunity that has arisen that people want to jump on. So now's where I'll jump into, into my example. So our farm got started um, subleasing from a friend of ours who had some underutilized space on the farm. So it wasn't really part of their farm's you know, long-term plan, but when um, we got to talking probably over you know, a beer or something like that in the um, middle of the winter, uh, it sort of became clear that this uh, was an arrangement that could work. Um, and so it was much more kind of informal in, in the conception, but uh, in effect, um, we were then managing this land together. And then finally, the mixed group. Um, so in, in this sort of case, maybe you're talking about a very large property um, or maybe just a lot of small operations uh, together. There might be some combination of, um, you know, multiple farms purchase a piece of, of land and then lease some of it to somebody else. Um, or, you know, one farmer owns the land and makes it a point to, you know, lease out multiple parcels to, to other farmers. But in all cases, um, what we're looking at is uh, creating more opportunities on a piece of farmland. Next slide, please. 
So we keep bringing this back to sort of values and and goals and um, you know mission of the the landowner and thinking about how they're um, how they're making their land available to farmers. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I like talking about um, group land tenure is that there's a lot of really good um, inspiration and and sort of big picture thinking and what we can achieve with these sorts of scenarios. Um, so I know for me, uh, an example that I love to think about and read about. Uh, this picture on the left of Fannie Lou Hamer, a famous um, organizer and activist from uh, Mississippi, uh, very active in the civil rights movement, and she um, helped to form Freedom Farms Cooperative, uh, which was a, an organization with the goal of purchasing pieces of land for uh, Black farmers to actually be able to have equity, um, create affordable housing, and also have uh, farm businesses that could, you know, coordinate and support each other. Um, so this this was back in the early to mid '60s that this organizing was going on. Uh, of course, they ran into, you know, lots of difficulties uh, given the the political landscape at the time. But in any case, a really, um, you know, powerful model for organizing and creating opportunities for farmers. Um, the bottom right picture here is is just a picture of, uh, I think that's me in there, building our um, first greenhouse on this property. Uh, and you can see the, the chickens from the uh, livestock operation were still running all over the place at the time. Um, but we certainly benefited from, um, you know, having those additional sources of fertility on the farm, uh, having some shared infrastructure, and also having someone to to call on when, uh, you know, we needed a hand. And uh, we were always happy to lend that hand as well. And then the last example is um, up in the top right, you see the logo for the Catskills Agrarian Alliance. Um, there, This is a group in uh, the Catskill region of New York that is doing a lot of organizing, both around things like food hubs and um, aggregating food from you know, a region that doesn't necessarily have a lot of marketing potential um, to, you know, they're currently working with Agrarian Trust on um, setting up a, a farm commons in their area, which um, is a structure that will allow them to provide um, you know, leases to uh, farmers in, uh, at a low cost, uh, again, in their area where um, getting established can be pretty challenging. So just some some examples to think about. Um, there's certainly more than that that I'd be happy to talk with anyone about. Um, but, you know, don't be surprised if a, if a group of farmers uh, gets in touch with you and are, are interested in talking through an arrangement like this. With that, I will... Uh, Let's see, there is a question in the chat I'll just address quickly. Um, we didn't really have time to get into a lot of the variety of lease arrangements that are out there, um, but ground leases can be a really powerful tool for sort of balancing um, you know, the equity that a farmer can have in the, in the property, as well as the sort of um, initial capital expenditure. I would point you to start towards Equity Trust, an organization out of uh, Massachusetts. They've got some really great resources on their um, website, and um, I think it sort of fits in nicely with the um, collaborative approach to land tenure. Rachel. Rachel. <laughs> Sorry, I pushed the button, but it didn't work. Um, I was just saying thank you so much to Jay and Sue and Nikki and Will. Uh, it was really great to hear from you all. Um, while we're waiting for Stacy, um, our guest, we're going to switch the plan just a little bit and take questions now. So you can either um, put your questions in the chat, and we're happy to field them that way, or you can use the, the little reactions button at the bottom to raise your hand and then we can call on you um, and you can ask it verbally. So whatever works for you and feel free to jump in. Um, we're happy to answer your questions. I'm happy to start out by asking or answering another one that was asked in the chat too, while we were going about finding out the going rate of leased land, um, which is a great question, specifically in your area. So those examples I shared were sort of New England based. Um, and a lot of this ends up being word of mouth, trying to do, find comparables or finding out what other people are leasing similar acreage for. Um, you know, the USDA and other organizations work to try to gather average rates. A lot of those can be pretty heavily weighted towards the Midwest or other areas where large commodity crops are grown. So if, if that's the area you're in, that could be really helpful. 
Um, also talking to farm linking organizations or um, other folks that help try to support people through leases. And even then it can really come down to negotiation about what it is you feel like you need from your land and what a farmer can afford and trying to find that sweet spot. But thanks for asking, it's a great question. Someone had a question in the chat about um, what kinds of soils would be good for which farmer um, and, and is also curious to know about how slope could affect farming ventures. So there's a bit of variety depending on the type of um, operation that somebody wants to run in terms of what's viable. Um, but let's see, as a as a general rule of thumb, I would say, you know, when you're looking at the soil maps as well, this will sort of dictate what gets called uh, prime versus, you know, local important or, or what have you. Um, most people doing tillage, vegetable growers, people planting corn, what have you, typically aren't going to look at much beyond an 8% slope approximately. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Um, hay, you can get a, a bit hillier, but not too much hillier because, you know, tractors do tip. Um, and then pasture land can be sort of, you know, rolling hills. There's there's benefits and drawbacks to, to that sort of management as well. Um, but um, those are just some kind of like general rules of thumb. Um, I think too with um you know orchards are another good example of you know an operation that can make use of hillier terrain um there are some interesting developments too with people doing lower till systems which uh, means that you could potentially um use slightly hillier land for something like vegetable production um but you know that requires a sort of different management style and uh, i would want to you know make sure that the the farmer had the support they needed in getting that set up, whether it was from an extension agent, um, NRCS, someone like that, uh, before entering into an agreement uh, for that sort of operation. Thank you, Will. And I see that Joey Diana Gates has their hand up. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> My my better stay care of a little horse I'm just getting over COVID. Um, um, can you, maybe you said this in the beginning, but I might've missed it. Is this land for good, uh, an extension program or is there a fee to work with you guys? Like, could you tell us a little bit more about, we wanna engage your services or more with you? Um, <clears throat> getting really serious and ready to start the outreach to make, to get my land converted. Yeah, thanks. No, I appreciate that question. Um, so, so Land for Goods is a nonprofit that works in all six New England states. So we do work directly with um, farmland owners, with farm seekers, um, and try to help figure out these arrangements or uh, succession planning or things like that. Um, so it, it kind of depends which state you're in with some different grant programs that are available. But in general, we offer up to two hours of no cost help for folks, um, which is often enough just to get some questions answered and help people get on the right track. Um, and can always look at uh, a sliding scale for fee for service stuff after that point. Um, I'm in New doing. York. And oh, okay. Is, is Landlink a part of this or is that something different? Yeah, there's a few different Landlink programs. There, there's there's um, there's New York Farmland Finder that's help that um, is partially run through American Farmland Trust or maybe fully run. So they, they could be a great, great source to reach out to there. What's um, it again, please? Oh, New York Farmland Finder. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I put the link to their website in the chat. Um, I also saw that someone had a question about land that's in conservation easement and what might happen when that land gets sold. Is there anyone who can speak to that? Yeah, um, so the a land trust or an organization who would be uh, the buyers and then owners of that easement they would pay for that easement. Um, so they don't get money from the sale of the land. They're actually contributing to that purchase 
to the landowner, if that makes sense. Um, I also wanted to touch on, there's been some questions really in about water regulations in Vermont. Um, as you can see, farmers have to navigate all these regulations and it's confusing. So I think what's being referred to of a farmer's income or sales to kind of determine their size and if they um, are required to follow certain regulations. Um, there are some water requirements based on a farm size and they also kind of include that surface water. I know Will had mentioned about maybe nutrient management and days before you can harvest leafy greens or that's separate than these new water requirements of just reporting surface water irrigation, which again, it's confusing, right? But that's kind of the land of requirements for farmers to have to follow. Um, and something about like surface waters, what is surface water? That's more of drawing from lakes or rivers and streams, not necessarily like tapping into groundwater or even building an irrigation pond. That was totally separate. John, it looks like you have a question. I do, yeah. Um, when you assist with uh, lease agreements, community license agreements, uh, do you include best management practices in the documents? How do you deal with that? How do you make sure that you're doing good work? Great, that, that's a great question. So looking at leases and looking at different management practices required by the, or, or um, that the landowner would like. So yeah, we in a lease, we tend to work on um, different, things that are either permitted or prohibited or need um, need permission from the landowner. So that can include things like organic practices um, or needing to request permission to do non-organic practices, things like that. There's also sections about um, stewardship. And so sometimes the tenant needs to be aware of a conservation easement on the land or other, other considerations that are attached to the land. Um, but sometimes that just, that also includes different, um, yeah, different considerations about whether it's organic practices, whether it's things like tillage or how much tillage. And so um, the way I look at it is it, it just, it really changes the size of, of your proverbial funnel when you're looking for a farmer. You know, the more the more restrictions there are, maybe the less far, the fewer farmers are available and interested in the property, but um, but you can absolutely come to mutual agreement depending on, on um, who's interested and, and what their production practices are and, and find ways to get common ground there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Can I take a little stab at the conservation uh, question? Uh, so I'm speaking from Maine Farmland Trust and how we work with our easements. I don't work in that specific department, but this is a simple uh, scenario of how we and how I've gotten it through my head after being there for 16 years. So a property will have a value, a chunk, say it's, I'm gonna use round numbers, $100,000. An easement will take off the value of what that would be to develop that land. So we're going to say that's $20,000. So if an easement is put on a property and you're the owner, whoever uh, puts the easement on, whether it's a land trust or the entity or whatever it is, that $20,000 can either be paid to the landowner or they can donate that amount of money and it can be a tax write-off for them. So it just depends on what the scenario is and what they decide to do. Um, so when you, if you were to sell your property, that easement would still go along with the deed and it still would be transferred, but no money at that point for the easement would be transferred because it was already transferred to you or outlined to you as the land owner. So that money has already happened and the easement would just be transferred with the deed going forward to the to the new owner. So hopefully that answers your question. And Rachel, if I may, it looks like Stacy has joined us. Yes, I saw that, thank you. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Stacy Brenner, who's the Senior Advisor for Land Access with Maine Farmland Trust. And um, after many years of serving on the board, um, Stacy joined as a senior advisor for farmland access. Um, Stacy focuses on building pathways to increase access to farmland for new and emerging farmers, and also for established farmers who are looking to expand or relocate. 
Stacy lives and farms at Broadburn Farm in Scarborough with her husband, John Bliss, and their two daughters, Emma and Flora. They raise vegetables and flowers and host weddings. Um, Stacy envisions a future that offers viable pathways to farmers to establish their businesses without having to accumulate the capital needed to purchase a farm um, and to connect farm businesses with available and affordable land that meets their needs as well as their businesses grow and change. Um, her resume includes work as a barista, an orchid greenhouse caretaker, a cotton farmer, and a nurse midwife. She holds a BS in agriculture from the University of Arizona and a BSN and MSN in nursing from the University of Pennsylvania. She has been settled in Maine since 2002. Stacy previously served on the board of the Maine Organic Farmer and Gardeners Association, and she is currently the Maine State Senator representing District 30, which consists of Scarborough and Gorham. So Stacy, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, Sue, I didn't see your note that the timing had shifted. My apologies. That is um, okay. It's in a committee meeting. <laughs> That's okay. I know you're so busy. I We really thank you for taking the time to step in and talk to us today. Yeah, I'm delighted. Yeah. So we just wanted to ask you a few questions and see if you could talk a little bit about your scenario and um, how it might differ or how it might be creative um, outside of just some general lease agreements. Um, we've been talking um, about some lease agreements and how they work and how different arrangements can happen. Um, so if you could just take a minute to explain what your current land tenure arrangement looks like, how you came upon that and, and what that looks like. Sure. So I probably have a unique experience with Maine Farmland Trust because I've been on the board. I'm now an employee and I was a user of probably every program that has come <laughs> along that the organization has put forward. But I was uh, we had two successful farm links. The first one I would say was successful, even though it didn't work out because it gave us a chance to um, get get our business up and running and going. Um, and then the second one um, has been much more successful. Um, the first one was with a private landowner, and the second one has been with the Scarborough Land Trust. The Scarborough Land Trust bought um, a 434-acre property in um, 2004 and put an easement on it with the help of the Land for Maine's Future program. And they um, had a moment where, the at that time, the, the woman who was... Um, instrumental in the LMF program came out to visit and said, you have soils of statewide importance here. This definitely needs to be a farm. And the land trust was, um, I would say in many ways, naive as a community land trust, naive enough to not really exactly know what they were saying yes to. Um, and so that was in 2004. And at that point, they didn't have any employees for the trust. It was just a group of um, board members and volunteers. Um, my husband and I um, submitted along with, I think seven other um, entities, uh, a, a proposal when they had an RFP in 2006 to find farmers to farm the property. And um, we showed up, we were chosen, um, and we initially started out with a five-year lease. Um, the five-year lease um, morphed into a 30-year lease. And we were still challenged in that 30 year lease model with the reality that um, we didn't have a really clear way of how buildings and infrastructure could be developed and maintained. And so we, we needed to come up with a different strategy. The land trust um, did not wanna sell us the property. Um, the, they did not wanna go back to the state and ask to divide the property. They didn't want to go back and alter the easement in any way so that we could buy the buildings and or maybe even the farmstead area um, in some way um, and have a, the ground lease underneath. Um, and so they basically wanted to leave everything as is. And so what we came up with eventually after the 30 year lease was something completely different where instead of the, the two of us as individuals renting the property, we changed it to a 99 year leasehold. And our business entity, which is a S Corp, Broadshire and Farm Incorporated, is the leaseholder. And the reason why we went in that direction is because it was the only way that we could come up with to tie our business together with the land and remove us as individuals, except that, the, that we own the business. 
um, that over time we could transfer the business, the corporation shares of the corporation to employees, to other folks that come along that are um, interested in, um, in the business in some way and the business and the land will travel together. And there's a couple unique parts of the lease. Um, we are responsible for the maintenance of all the buildings. So the lease, the, the lease um, fee is quite affordable. Um, we don't rent the entire property. We just rent the open fields and the farmstead area. Um, and we've agreed to have the whole place open for public access um, and to um, host a number of uh, events and fundraisers for the land trust. Um, and we, um, like I mentioned, we maintain all of the buildings. And so we have a sort of catalog of the building quality uh, when we took hold of that 99 year lease and what the expected um, maintenance schedule would look like over time for the for the structures. What that allowed us to do is the um, the 99 year leasehold allowed us to have the ability to um, to finally reach out and have some sort of um, traditional financing to grow the business. Um, we had for years been wanting to build uh, uh, like a separate built, heated building space that could function as the office for the business and have bathrooms. Because for many, 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 many years up until this past year, <laughs> the staff cooked all their um, lunches in our kitchen and used our bathroom in our house. And, and while that was totally fine when I was 28 and it was great when I was 38, by the time I turned 48, I was like, all right, I think we need a little shift here um, and COVID actually was what what did us in um, in terms of that that sort of picture of, of having being so intimately engaged. I, we have the greatest crew. Every every farm will say that about their and they've been with us for 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 almost a decade plus now. Some of them, so um, I would share just about everything with them. But um, I think they wanted some space and we wanted some space. So this arrangement that we have. Um, allowed us to make investments in ways that we hadn't felt comfortable before and we hadn't been able to access the financing before because um, uh, banks didn't feel comfortable loaning to us um, in with our, sh our shorter term lease, the way that it was designed. So um, that's kind of like a thumbnail sketch of our, our current lease situation. And I will say this is a bor borrowed term from, um, from uh, tribal workshop that I went to, um, this whole process moved at the speed of trust. And so it was a very long process of building trust with the board members on the land trust um, and getting to know each other and them feeling comfortable with our business practices and, um, and us feeling comfortable that we could make this big leap in this investment and say yes to this. Um, so. Yeah, those are great words. The, the trust, getting gaining the trust with um, you know a landowner in this case the the land trust. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you shifted from your business just being such a small starting thing into something where you're ready to have your employees and you know really that expansion and, and how that looked um, and did it involve talking to the land trust as the landowner and um, were you at the 99 year lease part at that point or were you back at the the 30 or the five? Where was that in your in your tenure? Um, so we had or in the very early years, um, we were part of the Mafka um, apprenticeship program. So we would have folks live on site with us in the house, cooking meals for them. Um, sharing bathroom, that whole thing. So they were, you know, part of our our household. Eventually, we built cabins for them. Um, eventually, we um, moved into a model where we had hourly employees. I think that was probably in two thousand and nine or ten. We had the, our first hourly employees, and from there, we've just kind of it's gone up from there. And we've sort of, you know, at, at one point, we had thirty employees, and we're, we're we've scaled back on certain things and re reconfigured the, the the business a bit and um now what we have are um four full-time year-round salaried folks and then a bunch of seasonal folks but those four people have been with us for years and they're kind of the core leadership team um they sh they share in the profit of the business and um are really instrumental in running pretty much everything which is what frees me up to do um other stuff 
So, all the things that you do, all the hats that yeah. you wear. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, and would you be able to talk a little bit about um, some benefits or challenges to what the current arrangement is that you have your lease arrangement, um, you sure. know, for some other owners? Oh, yeah. One thing I didn't mention, you asked whether or not we um, catch up with the land trust about employees. Um, mm -hmm. We have for years had, um, it was initially like a, every other month. Then it was like every three months and then four months. And now we meet with the land trust quarterly with a committee. And then we um, we have a report to the full board once a year um, where we join them for a meeting and kind of do like a state of the farm where we give them an updates and everything. But um, and so in those updates, we talk about our finances and we talk about our our staffing mix and buildings and infrastructure and plans for growth or scaling back or sort of what what's going on at the farm so that if we are trying to be as transparent as we can and um, keep them informed about what we're doing and um, we talk a lot about um, try to help them have some clarity around um, farming practices so we're mm -hmm. um, contracting with for an example would be we're contracting with NRCS because we're looking to put these high tunnels up because it will help us with season extension. And this is what season extension is. And, you know, we'll talk about that. And, um, and so sorry, I would say is, a benefit would be these quarterly meetings. Oh, with the definite the benefit. Trust. Yep. Yep. A definite benefit is the um, quarterly meetings, mm -hmm. the transparency, the open communication, and then, um, the just kind of the open door policy the board members come by all the time to visit um they see the farm as like a um one of the sort of keystones in their their like property portfolio wonderful yeah so um is though are those quarterly meetings kind of is that something that's written into the lease agreement? Like that is part of um, the the committee. The, so the the frequency of those meetings is not written into the lease, but the part where we connect with the board annually is, and the the idea that we would have a committee that meets regularly is written into the lease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you can you identify any challenges on either side of the coin, whether it be the landowner or you as you know was the land seeker, the lessee? Can you identify any challenges that may may happen or maybe have happened that you have experience with? Yeah, we have had challenges over the course of time. Uh, I would say mostly our, like John, my husband and I, we were ready to grow faster than they were ready to mm. um, say yes. Um, we, and so that was us needing to take a deep breath, slow down and say, okay, it's a good situation we have here. Let's slow down and bring everybody along with us and be patient as they um, learn uh, with us about what it is that we want to do and they can feel comfortable with the plans that we have. Um, the other, I, I mean, the, the sort of elephant in the room, right, is that like, it's a little bit of an experiment. No, we don't, we haven't met a lot of people that have tried this before. We definitely came up with it on our own. We ran it past our lawyer, but you know, this was after like many years of suggesting things that just didn't work out. Um, and so, uh, we don't know what it will really look like when we're ready to retire and we go to um, leave the business and how the shares will transfer and who will want it. Will it be worth anything? Will it be worth too much and no one will want it? Will folks say, I just want access to the land, but I don't want your business. Um, so we think a lot about like the value of agricultural businesses, the value of land, the association between the two, what's that intersection like? Um, and so I, I actually find myself thinking a lot about that just at MFT, because in many ways, I feel like as far as land access goes, I kind of won the lottery um, and um, I want to replicate the model because I, I do think it has viability. And I think what it does is it takes the, the for, for us, we know we're not going to retire on the value of the land. So we want to build our agricultural business as um to be as strong and as vibrant and as viable as possible so that when that gets sold, it has value and can transfer with that value. And ideally that's what we're ret retiring on. And on a good year, we save a little money in the, you know, all the channels that people save money in for retirement. But, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's not gonna be the, the land that we retire on. So in many ways, um, I think that presents um, opportunities and challenges because it, it presents ideally opportunities for 
farmers that are um, younger than us coming up that are going to be ready to go and we're ready to leave. And um, it maybe presents challenges because it's a little bit untested. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the typical phone call, I just took one yesterday was from a landowner looking to sell their property and her exact words were, this is our retirement, you know, so yep. you just, you have to look at it different ways. Um, so do you feel like your business model may at some point be a little bit, I mean, this is, we don't know what the future holds, but the potential is there for the business to be more too affordable. Like it's not going to be affordable for a younger farmer. So you kind of have to pivot at that point and figure out what that's going to look like. Is that kind of what exactly. I from you? Yeah. Yep. And is it that there are multiple partners that come in that are interested? Right. Is it that people want different, um, you know, we, we are, um, we grow a lot of cut flowers. Um, so will someone want the cut flower side of things and maybe someone else will want the garlic and produce side of things. So, mm -hmm. you know, what will that, what will that um, split look like in terms of um, value and, and interest? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have, um, can you explain a little bit? You've got one business, but you do so many different things there. Can you just say a little bit about what those, all of those things work and how they work together? Yeah. So if you can sell it and it comes out of the ground, I've probably tried growing it and selling it with the exception of cannabis, because based on um, the state and federal money that we've received um, in our lease, we do have a, a clause that um, we won't grow cannabis, which is fine <laughs> just to clarify <laughs> but anyway pork beef milk okay. uh, vegetables all those things we've tried all of it um and in the early years the big bread and butter of our business was um a meat and csa and a vegetable csa and um when i left my midwifery job we started growing cut flowers and there was this sort of like funny sort of shift that happened uh, kind of slowly over time and actually with a little bit of help from um, going through the Farms for the Future program, which is a um, kind of the farm viability program for the main department of ag, and also um, Maine Farmland Trust's um, farm, farming uh, for wholesale, I think was what it was called at that time. We made this big shift and we pulled away from the, from the um, vegetables and we really ramped up on the flowers. Mm -hmm. um, we just saw the market for flowers um, being untapped at that point. And the other big factor was that two of our longtime employees were way, way, way more interested in flower farming than they were produce farming. And they're still with us. Um, and so kind of together with them, we made this big switch together. And it was scary as all get out. I have to tell you, it was like we saved a bunch of money in case we had bad, you know, in the market. And, um, but it has worked out. And so we sell cut flowers. Our markets are, they're really broad. We do direct con to consumer through like funerals and weddings, design work, um, buckets of bulk flowers. We sell to restaurants and breweries and hotels, the same kind of mix of stuff, either fully designed or buckets of bulk stuff. And then we have a CS, a big flower CSA that has a couple of options of seasonal items. And then we sell flowers wholesale to floral designers who are looking to have local flowers for their own design work. So that's kind of the flower side of things. And then we, um, we have a seed garlic business um, and we have, um, we host events at the farm and um, it's about 10 events a year. Amazing. There's a lot going on there. I just want to encourage people if they had any questions um, for Stacy and her situation that I hadn't necessarily gotten to, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, and I do want to leave a little time for question and answer. Um, we've got about, I think about 15 more minutes. Um, but through your work at MFT, I know it's something that's new and it's still evolving. Can you give us a little information on what that looks like? You spoke a little bit about your model and how you want to, you know, encourage that and move that forward for other people. But do you have any insight on your your work at MFT and what you can offer? Sure. So MFT being Maine Farm Land Trust. Maine Farm Land Trust, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I spent the first, I started in May and I spent the first few months doing lots of research, trying to figure out um, what's happening in other places, what other folks are up to across the country. Um, and um, and then we sort of identified a handful of things internally that would make sense for our lands department to start to work on. Um, one big piece was um, thinking about how we could ourselves develop our own lease program. Um, we also realized that we wanted to beef up our Buy, Protect, Sell program and give 
farmers um, an opportunity to be able to lease from us while they are getting their business up and running so that they have the ability to grow capital and maybe consider buying if that were an option or maybe it's it, it, maybe over time we realize that it's a property that we need to continue to hold and lease out. Um, we also started to think more about whether or not we wanted to go back and put retroactive OPAVs on properties that we had historically um, put conservation easements on because we, um, you know, we were sort of watching the transactions happen for properties with our easements on them and, and the transactions aren't um, yielding a transition to production scale agriculture. Um, and so lots of concern there about um, whether you know the sort of what we had done historically with easements it felt so it feels so important and it, and it did then and it still does now to keep the land out of development but it wasn't quite getting us to the place always of getting more productive productive agricultural activity um happening on this property so um so we've been sort of slowly envisioning how those things are going to happen uh, as you can imagine they all cost money and so um with that's we been in sort of application mode for some money and rethinking how how the organization might use money and um, out of a lot of those conversations that i had in the summer and fall we realized that it was time sort of post covid to have an in-person convening of um, land trust and uh, farmland access professionals in the northeast and so we have this convening coming up next week and so i've been spending um, some time on that. And I know uh, those of you who've organized meetings like that, um, it does keep you up at night a little bit. <laughs> so I've been up at night thinking about that. <laughs> Among all of the other things that you do. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rachel asked a question about being a flower farmer. What do you do in the winter? Oh, great question. So, so we try to we try to stay in the market until through Thanksgiving. Um, and then we give, everybody takes a huge deep breath. We do a lot of dried flowers. So we still keep some accounts all the way through the year. So we're delivering um, to folks in Portland and in the Portland area um, throughout the winter. Um, but like now, right now we're, we're back in the greenhouses, seeds are started, um, tunnels are going, corms are planted for ranunculus and anemone in our, in our tunnels. Um, so there's really only um, like Thanksgiving till like about maybe second week in January that's real quiet but like my husband spent the winter like trying to understand how the website works and so he could manage it um, going forward and um, he uh, he went to Nepal with this is a great program all of you guys should consider this the um, the U.S. government has a program called um, Farmer to Farmer and it's through USAID and they match up um, folks that are, you know, service providers or farmers in the U.S. with programs and, and NGOs in other countries that are looking for support. And it's it's sort of, um, you know, U.S. Um, like relation building work. Um, so he was in Nepal for three weeks working on organic certification project with Nepalese farmers who are trying to figure out how to export things. And I this I'm this whole legislative thing that I'm doing now is is um, terribly <laughs> consuming in the winter. <laughs> um, we, have a, <laughs> we have another question. So maybe you can answer this. Do you live on the property or do you live off the property? Yeah, we do raise my kids there. Um, we, the, the house that's there, we, um, we maintain the, the house and the structures. Um, and mm -hmm. we've been there for, that's the house I've lived in the longest actually, I've been there for uh, 17 years. Nice. And retirement, do you plan to stay there or is your retirement goal to go elsewhere? I know that we will. Yeah, it's a great question. So the way the easement's written, um, we could build one more house on the property, one more residence. Um, oh. So that's one option. Um, but the way that the lease is written currently, um, folks working at the farm need to be living in the house. And that was intentional because we wanted to make sure. I mean, our goal is that this property is an active agriculture and so mm -hmm. we don't want to take up the struck the the residents if we're not actually going to be running working in a business there yeah yeah that's great any other questions people they can just put them in the chat um maybe just a little bit if you could do anything differently knowing what you know now <laughs> would you do things differently starting out your first one to ten years i would probably um brought people 
what would I have done? Like, I don't know. It's so hard. I mean, <laughs> like I wouldn't have, um, you know, forgotten to turn the hydrant off the other night and froze it. <laughs> well, know, there's a couple, you know, the, there's so many of those things where like, we just, we just messed a thing up and we could have done better if we remembered all the right things to do, but, um, you know, just a lot of silly mistakes. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I mean, we try really hard to not burn bridges and, and be like, you know, if, if, it, if employment situations aren't working out to sort of find graceful exits to um, the relationships so that over time, when we all run into each other again, it's cordial. Um, try, I mean, I think ultimately at, at the end, we just want to make sure we the property feels well cared for. It stays in agriculture and we, um, have a community around us that, you know, we, we still sit down to dinner with. Yeah, that's great. And it also seems like you, um, took advantage of the programs from the other, yeah. the other yeah. service providers and the other organizations. And it sounds like you really encourage that. And it is totally. beneficial There's for both so the land owners and the land seekers. I mean, both sides of the coin. Yeah, there's so much um, relationship building that can happen in any of those um, uh, service provider experiences with the other folks that are coming to the workshop that you get to meet and network with and learn about their operations and um, stay. Farming is pretty, it can be pretty isolating. I mean, you have mm -hmm. your relationship with your customers, you have your staff, but unless you get out of your, off your farm, you don't actually meet any other farmers. And there's so much um, great work that happens just in those relationships that get to be built between other growers. And like some of my best farming friends, I met uh, one, one couple when we did the Farms for the Future program and um, you know we've stayed close and I would never have gotten that close with them had we not sat next to each other in a desk in Augusta at the, you know, at the Department of Ag. So, um, taking advantage of those programs is not only gave us like time set aside to think really strategically about our business and have support and um, thoughtful guidance, but it also um, just gave us time to to be effective at what we're doing. So it was, it was great, and some of them are financially supportive. And you mm -hmm. know, MFT's program offered um, a grant, and Farms for the Future offered a low interest loan because we already had the conservation piece in place. So. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's another good thing to, to talk about. Um, and so that leads a little bit last week in our, our first session, I spoke a little bit about um, cluster farming, some smaller oh, yeah. cluster farming versus the larger spread out farms. And so you just speaking about your, you know, your farmer friends and, and this network that you had crafted so that's just another point where it doesn't matter how small your property is or if there's this many properties already around that there's already a you know a thriving farm on those smaller network of clusters they're just they're they're a good thing yeah yeah that's great um I don't see any more questions in the chat. I don't know, Rachel, if you, you're great at bringing up questions <laughs> if you had any others or Jay or Nikki or Will. Well, I guess actually I have a question for, for folks who have come this week and last week. Um, based on some of the things we've been talking about, what are some of the next steps that you're envisioning for yourself. And you can put this in the chat or you could say them out loud if you wanted to. Hi. Hey. Uh, George Mason here. <clears throat> well, clearly, I, I want to avail myself of, of these different programs, and um, so I, this is really just like the first first step for me. So I really appreciate all the information, and uh, and I I could see actually uh, navigating some of this with with the help of of your guidance. Um, uh, because it's it's really 
over my head in, involves family, involves land, and uh, there are just many components that uh, it just kind of has me sit down and just scratch my head. It's like, um, but um, uh, clearly um, I need to um, imagine some opportunities with people that have seen this happen. Uh, just to get over the horizon a little bit. So um, that's about where I am. I need to make some calls in your direction. Thank you. Thank you, George. We like to hear how things are going for you. And um, I'll make sure that everyone gets the links to the videos. This session and last week's session were both recorded. And so those could be resources you could send your family's way. They could watch them on their own time. Um, maybe that would help get the conversation started. Uh, Perhaps. Yeah, that's what I'm not sure about. Yeah. So I want to talk with you first. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you. Um, someone put some stuff in the chat, picking up the phone. Um, good to hear ideas floating around or, or things that others are putting into reality. Um, is there are there any outstanding confusions? Um, someone asked some good questions about how does this land trust thing work? Um, so anything that people would would like us to clarify or circle back around. You weren't quite sure you got the nuance or. Um, Stacy from, oh, sorry, go ahead, George. Well, just um, following up on that. Um, um, I, a, a few years ago, um, uh main farmland trust um, did come down to this piece of property and and look at it um and just gave me some idea of of what that might look like if it was um put in uh, as forever farm um uh, i'm 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 needing um some more um input in terms of different ways that the land could be utilized effectively in relation to the soil and in relation to the acreage. And so is that, that that's something that uh, Maine Farmland Trust could help me with, for instance, or land for good? Or is land for good more in the, in, in the fashioning of lease agreements and understandings between leasee and leaseor? I, mean, I can let let Sue speak for yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Sue. That's okay. I was wondering if Stacy wanted to jump in on that, but I'm happy oh, sorry. to. That's okay. Um, so I guess I would say yes, Maine Farmland Trust. We're happy to come and and speak with you about any situation that you've got going on your property. Um, I can say there's probably only a small handful of people at Maine Farmland Trust that are actual farmers <laughs> and, and know the ins and outs of what a property would be useful for. Um, Stacy, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe NRCS might be a good uh, to talk to about what the land is actually going to be good to be used for and learning your soils and what the soils are, are best suited for. Yeah, so we can um, we can produce soil maps, mm -hmm. and that combined usually with a visit to sort of get a like a, like a visual of what a slope look like, how are things laid out, how how much property is there that's open versus wooded, and where where's what does drainage look like? Um, it kind of gives us a sense of like could we is this are these tillable acres that could grow crops, or is this better for grassland for livestock? Is it more appropriate for Hey, um, so and and then scale, you know, scale is a big piece. So what what kind of scale are we looking for? Are we looking for, you know, someone that's gonna have a market garden or someone that can have a, you know, a 200 acre dairy or something like that? So, you know, the, all those things kind of there's a couple pieces to it, but um, you know, a handful of us in the land staff have that capacity. Um, and I, I can't speak for land for good, but I'm pretty sure I've seen that work come from you guys as well in the past so um but it's kind of it's it's kind of like a carrying capacity sort of what what can your land hold and what does nrcs stand for great questions you thanks for um reminding me that we're using acronyms without talking about what they are um the it's the um uh national resource conservation service 
Natural Research Conservation Service or National? I can't not you natural. Natural, thank you. <laughs> um, and they are a branch of the USDA that work on, on essentially um, like erosion issues is what they're charged with. It's, it came out of um, the Dust Bowl actually. Um, and so uh, they, they help with all kinds of practices that help you with, with to diminish soil erosion. And thank you. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Well, so it's 1.30 and I do wanna respect everyone's time. Um, we're happy to stick around if folks have um, outstanding questions. If you would be willing to fill out the evaluation form that I put into the link, um, as Jay pointed out earlier, we definitely use your responses um, to continue to make our programs better. So thank you very much uh, for coming and um, thank you, Stacy, for joining us. Um, and and we'll, we look forward to seeing you next time around. So have a really sure. great early spring. Thanks everyone. I popped my email in the chat in case anyone has any follow-up questions that I wasn't able to answer. <laughs>